there's one sentence I'd tell myself, probably be something along the lines with, I've gotten pretty lucky along the way. I mean, with every experience, every single thing that I've come across, but I think the biggest thing is to be so hungry, no matter how lucky you get, be so hungry to get to a next level, a new level and keep getting better. And no matter what happens, keep going at it, keep going after it, you could always get better. And that's kind of what we've talked about the entire time is you could always get better. Keep moving forward. Damn, right. Keep man. moving forward is right. Keep moving I love forward. that. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. We're just gonna do a rolling start here, Dill. I gotta, I gotta be honest. Tell you, look like you just got out of Mexico. <laughs> hey, papi, qué pasa, Holmes? I think I have to change this one, and I think I have to make it even better. I think we can do that. We can go here. What oh, these are. <laughs> oh, there you go. We're gonna stick. We're gonna stick with this one because I feel like this is putting me on an, on a, a, at least the same playing field, field as Nick with a. I had a mustache. Yeah. I got fly. Or I just, I it looked like I just took a little highlighter. I look like I just trans, just flew through time from like the 80s. All I need is a Honestly, mullet. Honestly, it does kind of, it does kind of fit both of you boys though. The Vinbergs could be a proud mustache family if you just yeah. let it grow out, Sean. Yeah, no, I, I think this, this might be a thing. So let's introduce our guest today. <laughs> we barely got him on the pod. So, so, <laughs> I mean, it took us 30 minutes to get a Zoom working. <laughs> And this kid went to he went to military school. I don't know. What are they what are they building there? So yeah, here he is. Denied from college out of high school, had to go to prep school in New Mexico, proceeded to get into United States Merch Marine Academy, played four years of college lacrosse there, broke his jaw, tore his ACL, graduated, sailed the world as an engineer, soon to be a Black Hawk pilot. Most importantly, as you can see, head of mustaches here at Footwork. And Most here he important. is, my brother. Nick Finberg, welcome to Footwork. Thanks. Thank you for the introduction. It's an honor to be here. I've seen you guys grown, you know, not having an internet connection <laughs> out at sea. Yeah. I've uh, I missed probably about, say, 10 or 12 episodes. You only have what? What are you on? Hey, we're up to like 40, 40, 40. With all the, I mean, nine? with the real oh, ones, 49, yeah. almost 50. I was a solid listener. I was a solid listener for the first part. He I, was. And I just feel like we didn't hear. We didn't hear from Nick for a long time, but there, there was good reason. There was good reason for this. But then we'd see, you know, like on the stats, oh, by range, just tuned in. <laughs> yeah, where <laughs> in the world? If you tuned into our newsletter, too. Were we you ever a, able to get Philippines on there? Did Philippines show up? Philippines yeah, we, is on we, there. We, we have that. I was passing through, and I was like, I, that one thing I need in there for just a time. <laughs> we stream an episode of Footwork real quick. <laughs> got to get them on the map. Yeah. That's All right. Where have so. been, though? Where, 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 you been? where is this this uh yeah this uh i mean really where have i been uh, in the middle of the ocean you know uh so when i first when i first flew out we flew to bahrain quarantine there because old covid thing went not in october <laughs> your mustache <laughs> yeah. does. you can't see on the podcast but the mustache on the zoom goes onto the coffee cup it's immaculate uh, and so flew out to bahrain stayed there for a few weeks Got on the ship and basically uh, just stayed in the Persian Gulf for 120 days, sailed around there, uh, Arabian Sea, Persian Gulf, then finally sailed over to Guam, uh, mm -hmm. through like Singapore, the whole entire uh, East Asia straits and whatnot. And then uh, here I am, flew home a couple of weeks ago. That you all, flew in just for the episode of Footwork, actually. That honestly all, that all took a course of what seven months or so but long story short that's the that's the simplicity of it yeah and he's back and he's finally on footwork yeah he's growing uh, out the uh, mustache for the, for the uh, this is why you pod. have this job at, at footwork head of mustaches <laughs> for the pod so how about let, let's run this back start us off how did you uh lead yourself down this path you know soon to be going to flight school to fly blackhawks um, where did this path start? Let's go back to high school. Um, and how, how did this become a thought? Yeah. So, uh, really started 
Uh, I actually, I should have brought it on here to show it on here, but I have a CD disc. I was just looking through the Jeep the other day and it's like 2004, so I was about seven years old and it's all like, God bless the USA. <laughs> I must have just been jamming the USA. Patriotic. There's seven, there's seven songs of God just, bless the USA. No, no, it just was real country I was music. Years old. It was from when oh, I was okay, seven okay, years okay. old. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, we, I mean, American most people are very patriotic and which is for any country out there um and so but however in high school had a teacher took us to West Point to the uh service academy for the army and it was actually funny because the guy who gave us a tour was a Black Hawk pilot and ever since then I was like wow that's pretty cool I read the book Lone Survivor which we all know Marcus Atrelli is a Navy SEAL so it's just a military book and uh so I read that, got me super interested in the military, a lot more interested than I already was. And then, uh, so I just knew, I knew I wanted to go to service academy. So during high school, just talking to different coaches, whatnot through sports. And uh, so Air Force Academy came up, became like uh, one of my choices. So I went out there, flew out there and the guy, the coach there said, all right, well you could come, but it was 11th grade now that I was visiting. And uh, so he's like, you come here, but you're going to have to go to prep school because we already filled our roster. I was like, I don't want to go to prep school, you know. So I was like, yeah, forget that. And uh, so then another coach, coach of my high school, Coach McSwiggin, he uh, was friends with the coach at Kings Point, which is United States Marine Academy, uh, for those who don't know. And uh, so he got me in contact with Coach Dwyer. And so we got to talking and yeah, so there was, and I knew I wanted to go to service academy and this was now the only one on my list. So here I was with one school, one dream school, went to my guy and counselor's office pretty often, uh, Ms. Byfield, shout out to her, uh, for telling me that you need more than one school on your list. You know, Kings Point's a dream school because it, it was whatever the SAT scores, whatnot, were pretty high to get in. Uh, which was clearly a problem for me, but I wasn't going to let it. And even though it obviously was a problem. <laughs> and uh, so, so anyway, so I took SAT scores. I took the SAT and ACT, I don't know, probably seven to 10 times each one. And I didn't get the scores. And so uh, I was like, well, I'm still going to go to Kings Point no matter what. So figured out some things, was always staying in contact with Coach Dwyer. And uh, my guidance counselor is bugging me every single day. I'd be talking to her because, uh, so now at this point, let's just say this point was like January, February, and I was denied from King's Point because my SAT score wasn't high enough for the verbal. And so I was telling my guidance counselor, I was like, well, I'm still going there. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm still going to go there. And she's like, well, you need another school. And I was like, well, I'm going to King's Point. She's like, you just got denied. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I don't care. I don't see how that's relevant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to King's Point. It's That's not the question. And uh, if you got to so, camp outside, he's going to go to King's Point. <laughs> <laughs> so she finally, finally convinced me uh, that SUNY Maritime's right across the water. And uh, so now I say this time was about May. And I still refuse to allow myself to think that I'm not going to King's Point because I knew I was going to King's Point. So I finally... It's like, all right, you know what? She's like, this is the exact same school as a state school right across the water. And then you could go there for a year and then you could go to Kings Point. I was like, well, I'm going to Kings Point. I don't really care about this school, but I'm going to Kings Point. She's like, all right, well, just, just like send in whatever. I was like, all right, just sent in whatever you needed to send in. Uh, probably gave them money or something for a deposit. And uh, so sure enough, they're like, yeah, you're accepted. Just like, well, it's whatever. It's the same amount of time. <laughs> and uh <laughs> this guy's still like wait this doesn't say king's point <laughs> exactly so uh went there i mean didn't go there sorry so i was finally accepted whatever and uh so mind you now this is past like may so everybody's wearing their shirts to school i remember the seniors you wear shirts of your college and i just showed up regular shirt eh, whatever not was that a, <laughs> was that a thing point. was that a thing in mass people where people it wore was, the shirts that they were going thing. to college yeah it was all like <laughs> you guys are so you know, cool pretentious schools, the harvard guys with the hats and that's so pretentious so pretentious it's mass people yeah. and so uh, i just showed up you know normal shirt 
normal, normal work day at school, you know. <laughs> He's got a king point. Sure enough. I didn't get into king points, I guess. I, uh, Doesn't matter. You can still wear the shirt. <laughs> um, so, so sure enough. So here we are. So my guidance counselor is all excited because, you know, I'm going to school now, even though I'm not going there. Uh, I'm going to King's Point, but I got denied. So it's a slight issue. Uh, so this is May. And so the month of May, really nothing really happened, I guess. And then June, right on Flag Day, June in June, I, uh, I'm sitting in my driveway and a guy shows up UPS and it ends up a little package and the USMA, they sponsor me to go to their prep school. So basically how it works is you go, they sponsor you, they pay for you to go to New Mexico Military Institute. So you go there for a year and then you automatically, well, basically automatically get into Kings Point the next year. I was like, this is golden. That's all I needed. I knew I'd get there. So that's my story for getting King's Point. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I remember that. I mean, it's just, it, it, it just like pure, I don't know if stubbornness is the word, but kind of just like, I'm going to King Point. Done. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's kind of how I've been with most things out too. Yeah. I mean, I just, it's just funny. When we, when we were prepping this, I saw some of the notes that were put down. And I just couldn't, I couldn't skip over this. I feel like we could have done the whole episode on Nick joining us, Sean, when we both played for the Greeks yeah. um, in a New York City League, a Cosmopolitan League for those. I think we've mentioned it before on previous pods. But yeah, Nick, I don't know how we must, we were, we didn't have enough people. Oh, which I is know just, how. Which was classic back yeah. then. And um, yeah, we needed a goalie and uh Nick, you know, just <laughs> well, I don't even know this story because I was at I, that was my freshman year at King's Point. So because I know it's bald in that picture. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So let's let's tell the story about the day. So he had a game and I haven't been to any of his games like at, at with the Greeks yet. So I was like, all right, let's let me go to one of your games. I was finally home for a weekend, my first liberty or whatever. So I went. And now we're sitting in the locker room. You guys get ready in that little rock locker room. And I'm just like sitting on the side of the field watching you guys like warm up and whatnot. Then Sean comes running over to me. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, <laughs> I was, I think I had a camera too. I was ready to take some nice photos. He's like, hey, you want to play goalie? And I was like, what? <laughs> Did you have a busted I mean, knee too or no? I mean, I was definitely, I've, I've always been all busted up, but I knew that I haven't played goalie. I mean, I haven't played soccer in now. I don't know. Three years. Yeah. Yeah. At least three years. And I mean, goalie (laughs) has to be at least since like, uh, oh gosh, four or five, six years ago. Yeah. So just messing around. So so to give a little backstory on this, the Greeks, you know, semi-professional in New York, pretty high level, you know, you have some ex-professional players there, but our coach at the time was just a scatterbrain. And it was always like, we don't have enough players. The guy, they shows up at the wrong time. And like, we don't have a goalie. <laughs> and we're playing a, a very good team on this day. And Nick's just standing there. And after like, he's trying to call so many people. I'm like, hey, I think my brother maybe could play. Like he played goalie when he was younger. I have boots in the car. So I just ask him, he shows up. Nick then pretends to be, uh, pretend that he's Pell, Vinny Pellegrino. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> that's nothing he like him. To be Nick's he's also nothing. like, Four tall. inches, five inches yeah. taller than him, <laughs> and yeah. the refs like, yeah, sure, it looks like him, and uh, it's like, it's like, it's like I said, this mustache, yeah, I'm Pablo, yeah, all right, up I'm in that. fifteen in crayon. <laughs> so it's great though because when I was getting ready, so <laughs> like we have a jersey, we have shin guards. Sean gave me old pair of cleats, so my toes are poking out. <laughs> It's so funny that day. Like he's he's standing in the background with a camera, and then like five minutes later, he's like ready to play. No one, no one around was like, "How did this guy just go from the photographer to like the starting keeper?" I don't know. That's that. That's that league though. Sometimes that's the like, league. It's just like so, it's, it's the wild west of. I'm seeing you guys warm up. You guys are just zinging it into the goal. <laughs> so here I am. I got Wait, did we goalies. win that game? What happened? No, we ran up losing, but it was it was actually like a decent game. Well, did wait, Nick make any? Do you make any saves? I can't really. I remember. I remember one one saves, one, but, one save in particular. Let's not get past the warm up though. Let's not get past the warm up. So I go out here. There's a miscommunication. 
<laughs> there's miscommunication apparently because Sean said I played well Sean said I played goalie the coach took it as I am a goalie <laughs> so I get warmed up these gloves are so big on me so I go down and now we're going right out <laughs> we're right outside the goal and you know the little goalkeeper drills where the coach is like two feet in front of him and he just like Drop almost kicks like it. punted at you to put in your gloves yeah, so yeah. Like, like doing it. He's like, you play you play goalie before i was like i was like yeah i mean i played he's like all right he starts killing me with the ball. <laughs> first one <laughs> off the head second one like, in the goal every five i would like catch perfectly and the next one it would slip through my hands hit my stomach <laughs> I mean, talk about, I mean, talk about making your own path. We can make the whole episode just based on this. I mean, just get off the sidelines and just play goalie one, one night. Yeah. You got to be ready. We, we talk you about it all the time. You got to be ready 365 days a year. Even if it's not your sport, opportunity. that opportunity comes knocking. <laughs> you never know when that opportunity is going to come. As much, as much as I would love to dive into this night even more, I am because I actually haven't seen or talked to you in a while, Nick. So I'm very very interested on on what's been going on and you know the places you've been and and like this military life thing so i mean i don't know where we start with it because it is just such a like crazy topic to me just in general so i don't know man tell me where like what's going on where you you've been flying blackhawks what the hell (laughs) military as far as like the lifestyle and uh I mean, I've also only been in school for the last five years, but uh, so it's not, it's no different than being like an athlete, I feel as military, because just you're a part of something greater than yourself. So what the military is, though, is everybody's kind of just a lot more deeply, the goal is a lot more common, like, whereas on a soccer team, you don't know, like, everybody's goal is to win, obviously, and forward, but some people are out for themselves, some people want to get better just for themselves or whatnot. Like the military, it's your goal is America or whatever country your goal is, like mm-hmm. your your common uh, your common love. So that's what kind of it relates. Military and sports go like hand in hand because yeah. it's it's just being a part of something bigger than yourself. And yeah. so uh, that's always what I wanted in discipline. That all all ties together in the regimented lifestyle. But I mean, it starts when I went to prep school. Uh, I was army prep school, so. New Mexico Military Institute is in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico. And I, I just loved it. You know, uh, you wake up every morning for formation, six o'clock. You get up every Wednesday, you have a uh, parade practice, zero five hundred. So, I mean, it's just a regimented lifestyle. You had, you always had something to do. Could you, could you walk us through like a day? Like you wake up, like you said, right. and then like, Tell are we doing like this bed inspection things that Definitely. like, I, I mean, see, yeah, like, what so, is a day? Uh, so, I mean, every, every day is slightly different, but Monday through Friday is basically the same. So, I mean, this is four years ago, so I'm going to think about this one. But basically, you get up in the morning, say you get up 0600. Uh, well, so I was part of Ranger Challenge, too. So, we'd get up 0500, and uh, we'd go for a rock or whatever it is, a workout for an hour, get back, shower, whatnot. And then uh, what is it? What is a ruck for people who, who may not know? Yeah, right. You're, you're right. You're right. Uh, it, I mean, <laughs> I barely if I didn't know you guys, I probably sure. wouldn't know what a ruck sure is. Your simple ruck is just put on a backpack with a lot of weight in it and just go mm-hmm. walk. But it's not it's not a walking. It's not a running. So it's, it's like, like a trudge. It's like yeah, a power walk. Wish, yeah. You wish you could like jog because it'd be easier. Easier. Like almost on your yeah. calf and everything. But it's more like a mm-hmm. fast pace. Gotcha. That's a rock. It's like if you ever seen those track events, you know, like the fast walking, speed walking. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Um, like you picture Nick like he's just like waddling back and forth with a sack. There's a little, a little less butt. I'm sorry. Okay. Same, All right. So concept. we same concept. Okay. So we're going. Uh, so we're going for the rock. Zero. Yeah. So zero six. Uh, get back zero six thirty zero seven hundred. Uh, was muster. So which is uh, what or formation actually is army musters navy uh so your your formation would be you go outside your room so we lived in like a box which is uh for those not familiar which is nobody uh with new mexico military institute it's basically we all live in like um kind of looks like a prison basically and you go out everybody forms up uh like and ranks basically in like three lines and you all face like one direction and uh then you're 
your sergeant or whatever, whoever comes around and inspects your shoes, inspects your, inspects your uniform, makes sure your shoes are signed. Uh, just the basics of wearing the uniform, basically. And uh, <clears throat> so you, they'd raise the flag. You salute. If one. everything's sorry to interrupt, but if everything's not like in tip top shape, there's like a so spot you on your stuck. on your yeah, shoes. You like stuck. what happens? You get what stuck. Is- uh, I mean, so I mean, the worst that could happen is you basically have to like march for an hour in your dress uniform with a rifle in your hand. So that's like so. Say if something bad happens, they say you give you one. They stick you like one one hour of marching. So you go. Which is what. <laughs> You just march around campus on like a Saturday. Yeah. On a Saturday, there's just like a square on campus and you just march that for an hour, like holding your rifle on your right arm, long sleeves, but not New Mexico. So it's not ideal. I mean, you don't make the same mistake twice. Like if you, if you get caught with your shoes shined, not being shined, they're just going to now look at your shoes every single time. So. So it's it's something like, it's like once you're pointed out for it, like you never see guys or girls make the same mistake again. A hundred percent. I mean, there's obviously always those kids who are always just messing up, but they have other issues that they need to worry about. And uh, all right, so the flag gets raised. Everybody marches into the mess, the mess deck or chow hall, because that was the army terms for it. Uh, and so you go, eat, you eat together, everybody eats together. Now, hold and on, stop there. When you're eating, isn't there a rule? Right, so at NIMI, yeah. So basically you had a, when you were, when you're a, a rat or a plebe, whatever the the lowest you just got to this okay. school, basically all these terms all these terms you're gonna have to like when you first it down get, right i know i know <laughs> so when you first get there uh so basically you're just the lowest on a totem pole so you basically have no rights they shave your head uh you have to square every corner these are just some simple things so squaring a corner means that like whenever you're outside you have to run no matter where you're going, you have to run the entire time. You can't walk. You have to stay on the right side of the sidewalk, right next to the grass, like six inches away, and you just run. When you get to a corner, you have to stop, and then you square. So you, like, perfectly make a right turn. Like, you go, a right make a right turn. turn. Perfect right angle turn, and then you start sprinting again. And obviously, when you, wow. when you square the corner, when you square the p- corner, you have to say snap pop or whatever it is because it's a two- a two a two count motion so all all around campus all these these young bucks they're all screaming snap pop at the top of their lungs and then just sprinting so it's it's pretty comical but that's just one yeah, it's all sean yeah. doing that at oneonta too it's the only it was the only one it was kind of weird in that situation <laughs> sean why are you yelling snap pop like we just got to the dining hall i know it's chicken i know it's chicken tenders day but like chill out <laughs> okay okay all right uh, we so anyway back to my day though uh when you're eating you have to keep your eyes on your plate the entire time you can't talk at all so you can't look up you can't have a conversation with anybody you just keep your eyes on your plate the entire time you have to keep like a uh, sit on the first six inches of your seat and just very just very proper just putting discipline in your life because you know all these kids we all have never been a regimented lifestyle as far as military ever so this is just like they hit you hard with it right in the beginning to kind of reset you just like any They're, boot camp or anything it's kind of like a shock it's like a shock exactly. therapy in a way exactly. to kind of like okay right Understand. and um so that and there's all these terms that i can't remember now but when you you have to ask permission for everything uh so it's like if you want salt and pepper like permission uh, to use the the twins or whatever and if you didn't say it right or say it loud enough, then like the, your cadre at the end of your table would be like, no, and just can't have salt and pepper today, I guess. Man, well, what, hey, you, it goes what if that dish needs some salt? Oh, it needed it. It needed it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. I didn't like, I mean, I didn't know that there was so many little things involved. Okay. Yeah. Keep us going. I mean, it goes for everything too. I, and you need a drink of water. You need to ask for the water. It's down mm-hmm. the way. And the, the, the worst part about it is that there's say 10 of your, your, uh, your classmates or whatever, say at your table and there's one cadre. So you obviously all need water. So each one of you has to scream and get permission to get the water. So if, the, if there's one, if you're the one man over here is just messing up and is not getting the water quick enough, that's delaying everybody else from getting water. 
So mm. he has to get it right. The next person has to go. The next person has to go. Next so it's, it's all like accountability in this right. thing. It's kind exactly. of teaching. And then that's like... what it kind of shows you. And you start like, as the time goes on, you're like a well-oiled machine and everybody knows exactly what to do. And you get your water pretty quickly, you know, a mm. month in, two months in, you learn a lot quicker than that, but that's just going to show that it's just discipline. It's everything you, you learn what you need to do and you do it. And it's better. There's no, you don't make up an excuse of like, oh, this is too hard and not do it. Just do it. You do it and you do it the right way. Right. Exactly. And it seems like they're really trying to like really hound that, like the group is more important. So if you fuck up, then it's, and it shows on the rest of the group. So don't fuck up. And that's a, that's a bigger part too of, uh, I mean, we're still trying to go through the day right now, but that's like a big lesson I learned there is whenever we doing anything, say if we do room inspections, whatnot, if somebody messed up like the entire, the entire like troop or platoon or whatever would pay for it as well. So, and you learn from it. So if they'll yeah. tell you exactly what he did or if he didn't have his socks folded or whatever hung in the right order, then no other person would make that mistake because say if he didn't have his socks folded and then somebody else the next day doesn't have their socks folded, it's just like, what did you not learn about yesterday doing 50 push ups for him not having a socks full, you know? Mm. So it's just like you learn, you learn through from each other and you mm-hmm. do it like for each other. Like you're all coming together as a team and a group and you're getting better together and learning the rules. Like everybody messes up. No, nobody ever like goes after anybody for messing up. Like, you know, going into the school, you know, you're going to get yelled at for messing up everything. You've never been in this lifestyle before. Never, yeah. Right. Correct. It's very interesting. We'll come back to your day, but just, I mean, a few podcasts ago with Joe where he was doing a discipline thing where a guy fucked up, Sean, you remember, and he made the rest of the team run. Right. And it's kind of like that same idea. Like, I mean, it's not just you fucking up and then you have to pay the consequences. It's like, and I guess that's really what they're trying to like teach you guys is when, if you fuck up here, you know, it, it is what it is, but when you're out there in some type of battle or something like the consequences can be so dire. So you always have to be thinking about not just yourself and every, everyone around you. It's not, about cool, you. it's a very cool concept. And kind of where that relates that you just thought like, just the fact that it's not about you. We first heard that in the go rock in high school, where is the shirt they're all about not about you. And I understood it, but not truly. And then when I was in New Mexico, uh, we were rocking. So our cadre, we're a bunch of sergeants, all enlisted guys. Uh, but these, these, they are war fighters, all these guys. And, uh, they've been Iraq, Afghanistan. And so we're, we're rocking one day and I was a five mile rock or something. It's starting to suck. And the sun was just about coming up now. And they're starting, like people were slacking off and you started to hear some complaining and it's like, everybody's going to do the exact same thing. So complaining is like not going to help the entire group. Like why would you complain to bring everybody down? And so Mm. whatever they're complaining about, they got blister, whatever this, that. And then the guy, this, this stuck with me since then. And he's like, uh, whatever complain. He's like, at least you guys aren't getting shot at right now. And if you like put in perspective, like, yeah, that's actually crazy. We're not getting shot. Like you could be overseas in the middle of a war right now all this stuff that's going on and then also people shooting at you terrorists or whatever shooting at you like you don't even have a problem right like there is no struggle in your life right now compared to like you're not fighting for your life you're just fighting because you're feeling sorry for yourself and you have a little blister on your foot and so it just like puts in perspective that Mm. you know it could always be worse and there's no reason to ever like bring the team down or bring down you know, uh, bring negativity into the group for right. like your, your little problems that you have going on right now. Mm. Right. Yeah. Perspective. Yeah. Perspective. It's all, it's all relative as well. All right. So then where we are, we're, we just finished lunch <laughs> or we breakfast. breakfast. We finished breakfast. breakfast. So now, uh, so after meals, you're allowed to walk. You don't actually have to run after meals just for, uh, you know, human nature I'm say, that's probably not the greatest thing for digestion you just gotta go sprint <laughs> right after you uh so you can walk you still have to stay on the right side of the sidewalk and uh so you go back go back to your room you get ready for class you have class 0800 to to uh noon 
you have another formation. So the same thing goes on. And it's just formations are mostly for accountability purposes. See if it makes sure everybody's there, everybody's alive, whatnot. Uh, so you, now you march to, to lunch, eat your, uh, eat your lunch, get back 1300 class again. So you go to your classes until 1600. Now 1600, you usually have side range challenge or whatnot, but you have a PT session of some sort. And so you work out for an hour. And then 1700, uh, you go back to your room, 1730, you have another formation for, uh, for dinner. So you have your formation, march to dinner and whatnot and go eat. And then there was a lot more strict. So from 1900 to 2130, it'd be study hall. So we are all freshmen in college, basically at that point. Uh, so study hall is like a mentor. You have to be in your room. They'll come around either in your room or library. So they'll come around to your rooms, look in your window, make sure you're actually studying. So it just forced you to like not be messing around, which is great. And a lot of the, a lot of my friends who we all went on to Merchant Marine Academy, we didn't have that there. And it was like weird because we're like, we're so used to just like being forced to do our homework. You get, you would get so much work done in those two and a half hours. Right. Like you just sit down and you're forced to stay. So it just taught you a good way to like, just another regimented thing that made it very easy. Like the regiment makes it very easy to live your life because it tells you exactly, you don't have to think, you just do, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so if you just do the like exactly what they're saying, then that's how, that's how you succeed. Mm. And, now, was uh, it, was it tough for you to like go from, like if you were out of school, if you were on vacation or at home or whatever, was it hard for you to kind of go back and forth between such a regimented life and then kind of where you can, make the rules like was that a tough transition it was just it was just a very strange like you because i mean i whether it's human nature whatever it is you want you want order in your life you know so when you go home and you don't have order you're just like something's missing or mm. so and then as the time goes on it starts getting built into you so you just automatically do exactly what you've been doing uh whether it's waking up at 6 a.m or doing this doing that so order is just good to have have in your life and so you just keep on with it in the beginning it's very weird i mean a lot of good things stick to you like sir ma'am whatever that stuff is and like you'd have to sandwich like uh sir yes sir ma'am yes ma'am so donkey. When you home, sometimes that'd come out a little bit donkey, yes donkey <laughs> and people, people are like what are you saying like sir yes sir okay whatever um. and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Now, sir, I just gave you a bagel. You don't have to say sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> now, while we're on this, bring a little comedy into this. So uh, you just were talking about formation, how you have to line up basically whatever is three times a day. Right. Um, they check in, everyone's alive, make sure everyone's still there. You're in front of basically every student out there. Um, and when you went to New Mexico, when you're during this indoctrination, you don't have a phone. Um, so the family and friends can only write you letters. Right. And you can write letters back to us. So I remember writing you a letter. And then at lifeguarding, we worked together. <laughs> there was this competition. And we called it lifeguard Olympics. And it was against all the different beaches competed against each other in different events, like for fun. So our lieutenant at the at the beach decided to write a letter to Nick's school, <laughs> New Mexico Military Institute, requesting that Nick is flown <laughs> Back to Long Island for Lifeguard Olympics. Now, Nick, please take us to what happened here. Well, mind you, so, so you're scared. You are beyond scared during it. Now, you get there, and they take everything away from you. They cut your hair off. I mean, you're bald. Everything, they're just screaming at you the entire time. You're running. I mean, you, there's nothing. You're just, like, in complete shock, and you're just, you just follow exactly what they do. You, they could tell you to, like, I don't know. They could tell you to stand on one foot with your arms above your head for three hours and you'll do it. Cause you just have no clue what's going on. And uh, so we're in Indoc and we're doing push-ups or whatever, doing a lot of running. And they're yelling at you every day. You're always messing up. Sure enough. Uh, one of the senior chiefs uh, comes over to me. He's like, who is uh, Lieutenant Bill? So-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> So-and-so. And I was like, <laughs> mind you, a Lieutenant, lifeguarding is not a lieutenant military that's just because he's yeah. lifeguarded like not, a, not a year or two more and so he signed this letter that he wrote lieutenant so uh so obviously the senior chief he's enlisted but he's the highest enlisted there is in the navy and 
so he's asking me who this guy is. And I was like, I have no clue who this guy is. And he's like, well, he wrote the letter, wrote the letter to, and it went to the commandant. Now, mind you, remember when I was saying before how you have to march and whatnot, you get stuck. Well, the commandant is the one who does that at like, at these, I mean, obviously students do it above you, but he's the one who really is the, he's like the dean, call it, of a regular school. And so, uh, so he sent it to him and I was like, what? And so he's, and I have no clue what's going on. And so he shows me this letter and it's just saying, basically for short, I wish I had a letter, but for sure it was like, um, yeah, I see, I know, I understand your training is very great and uh, it's good for uh, Nicholas's health. And uh, I know, I understand what you're doing for our country and his commitment to our country, but we have lifeguard Olympics. And I know that this training is much more uh, it like, it needs a lot more. It's better. What is it? Uh, more strenuous really working. Or something. Yeah. It, it's, it's a bit, yeah, it's more strenuous than your strength training there. And like, it won't be a problem. He'll stay, he'll maintain his physical health, if not get better, whatever it is. And then he, and then he, and he ends it and he goes, and uh, I'd like for you guys to fly him back on this date, this time, uh, by your uh, at your own cost via helicopter we're in new mexico. <laughs> we're in new mexico and he's telling that my school these these army guys to fly me back to new york for lifeguard olympics via helicopter so they think he, he's telling them to get, get a black hawk and fly me back to new york and so now i'm just standing here i'm just like oh my gosh i'm about to get kicked out i think i'm gonna get kicked out and so uh I don't know. They just yelled at me. I probably did some push-ups. And he ended up just like uh, the commandant just like kind of threw it at me and whatever. But uh, I paid a little bit for it. But the fact that he sent this to school and I was just scared beyond belief when I saw this letter and I was like, are you kidding me? I was pretty mad at him at the time, but it's very funny to look back on now. But just I was, I, praying. I, I was praying that they sent you back to help. <laughs> I was praying that that was the end of the story. But I was like, I, I would have heard about this. Yeah, I didn't I don't, I don't know. I don't know how he got that. He, he really looked into this because it was priority mail too. I remember looking at the envelope. He spent like $28. On the something. thing is, the thing is, it wasn't a joke. Like he was being serious about it. Right. right. Like that's like, like imagine sending a letter to like the white house saying like, yeah, we're going to need the vice president to come to, uh, to Germany to compete in uh, the footwork challenge. Right. <laughs> footwork 50. It's like, you can't even believe what they're reading. Right. And here, here, young Nick is just scared out of his mind. <laughs> uh, it's terrified. But, I mean, just because you learn at those schools, especially right in the beginning, like, do not, you don't need to stand out. Like, just be under the, under the radar. Just do the work. Like, be the best at what you do. Push your limits. But just, like, don't do, like, just, you know, just, they shouldn't know your name. If anything, they know your name for, like, I don't know, being the best at uh, rocking or running having the best like fitness test or whatever but they shouldn't be knowing your name for like just this guy who got a letter sent to him requesting to go to lifeguard olympics and so mm. it's like hundreds and hundreds of students and now they know my name because lieutenant bill decided to send a letter requesting billy to load back. <laughs> billy we interrupt billy. our program to bring you this important message yo what's up it's elijah banksy i'm gonna spin this song pierre moss produced by john boy ice off flea tape you can get that anywhere, free tape on Apple Music, on Spotify, on Tidal, SoundCloud. Um, you can follow me at Elijah Banksy, E-L-I-J-A-H-B-A-N-K-S-Y, on all socials. And uh, shout out to Dylan. Yo, what is up, Footwork people? Dylan here, just introducing our new promotional series, kicking off with my guy, Elijah Banksy. Basically, we just want to highlight and promote the people we believe in, the businesses we believe in, the ones that's making their own path. So let's build it together. Reach out to us, get in touch if you want to promote yourself, your business, anything. This is all for the dream chasers. So with Elijah, make sure you cop that new tape, and don't worry, we're going to run the rest of the song at the end. Cheers, guys. Yeah, so just to, to touch on, like, I mean, we've talked about in the military, just it's, for lack of a better way to say it, it's kind of like a loss of self in a way where the group is just like everything. So I just wanted to kind of touch on, like, just individualism and then group. So like when we grow up and, you know, still it's kind of like, you know, you're always 
taught and you're supposed to think like I'm special in this. And like, do you feel like that's lost when you like enter the military? Like, is it tough for you to like, I don't know, be like creative and individualistic instead of like looking at the group first always? Do you know what I mean by this? Yeah, I understand. I think there's definitely a part of that uh, as far as your there's no longer, it's like, you're a lot less selfish about things. Whereas, so sometimes, uh, I mean, you should always, as an athlete, you've always kind of been in it for the team and whatnot. But when you, when you join, when you're in like a team in the military, whatnot, uh, like your goal, your goal. So there, obviously there's like, a, there's a whole respect thing, chain of command and whatnot, but that still doesn't stop you from like, bettering the team like how and how i always put every single person you're still an individual on the team and you're for a common goal and maybe you're you won't always have the say in what to do and exactly your point but you just everything you just you absorb everything so like in the ranks in the bottom ranks say when you're freshman year and whatnot growing up sophomore year junior year you're kind of just taking everything in you're just you're kind of following along you're you're absorbing what good leaders you like like what bad leaders what you don't want to be like and it kind of is like developing you as a person while you're like learning through the ranks that's kind of how you take it like you don't always need to be the person who's giving the answer and like because your way is not always right so it's more when you're when you're I thought of as growing through the ranks you're kind of and even now like I just commissioned so I'm an 01 second lieutenant that's the lowest officer there is I mean obviously there's enlisted too but I still my career is just getting started. So you, I'm going to take in everything from people above me. And as far as like the whole group mentality, when you're in a team, I think it's more, um, you, you have like your individual worth and what you do, what you do for the team is that you get better. You're getting better yourself to allow yourself to be better and make a better impact on your, for your team and make your team better. You don't just, Like, it's just making everything you do for the team, but that doesn't take away you stopping yourself from getting better. It's just changing your mindset of why you're getting better. It gives you a better reason to get better. Mm -hmm. So like, um, for example, if you're your team, like when we were rucking, if you're always the last person, you're not helping your team. Like you're Mm going to now work overtime and work all afternoon and ruck every day and get stronger legs, get in better shape to now be at the front of the line, like in the front of the pack, pushing everybody rather than slowing them down. Cause if you start going faster, then another person will notice they're in the back. So they're going to get better. Now the next person they're going to notice they're in the back and they get better. So I think it's more like you have individual, you still have like, as long as you keep that competitive mindset and you keep the team in mind, you still have like an individual way of thinking, but it's mm-hmm. more just, you're you're more driven for the team team Mm, okay yeah and now what what about leadership you mentioned that um you you learn what good leaders or bad leaders do what have you taken from you know your five years in military academies and then now you're out working uh, in the field and then will soon be in flight school right i mean there's well the, the biggest thing is there's a million different types of leaders and not no one leader no one way of leading people is is the wrong way or the right way and like the Mm -hmm. my biggest challenge and you guys would face the exact same thing is that we're used to so yeah captains of teams captain of this you're used to being a leader like a lead a captain being a leader of a team so the easiest way that you'd be a leader in sports is by example you know so if you, when you do sprints, you'd be the first. If you're the captain, you should be the first every single time. There's no reason for you not to be. If you're like, you should be, you should be basically the best at every single thing, or at least try to be as, at least that's what I always took it as when I was growing up. And then when you start going into military, there's so many different aspects. And now you're meeting people, especially when I got to King's Point, you're meeting people who are not like you, who are not athletes. And so now it's like, how do you relate to them and lead them? And so you kind of, you just have to, there's obviously a goal in mind. And then you just have to relate to every single type of person you meet. You can't just 
you can't be closed minded to just like, oh, I'm only going to hang out with the athletes or I'm only going to no learn about the guy. My roommate freshman year, he was homeschooled from Wisconsin, homeschooled his entire life, never played a sport in his life, painted soldiers every single day. And you have to learn how to talk with him, how to lead him and get him motivated to do something. How do you get a guy who's never run a mile to run a mile and like push himself to run that mile? Like that's, that's the best part about, and that's why the opportunity I was given at King's Point, I was lucky for it because you meet all sorts of people as, as similar as they are to you because they serve, like they signed up for the service academy. They're really, they're really very different than mm. every, no person was the same. Mm. And I like uh, what you so, said there. I mean, just the leadership and empathy are like two things that go like really, really hand in hand. Like you have to understand the person that you're leading and t- in order to get them like to, to reach their potential. Right. Figure out what makes them tick and then yeah, and yeah. push them. Exactly. And I, I definitely used that um, when I just went out sailing. I mean, so now you're an officer on a ship, which means nothing. It just means you went to school, but these guys, who are out there, I was the youngest guy on the ship. And so there's in the engine department, say seven guys, seven officers, but there's 40 people in the engine department. So all these guys there, I was the youngest person there. And so now every single one of them, all the unlicensed guys, which is just, they didn't go, they, they didn't take this test to get their license, but basically they're not officers. They have to, they're the ones, they're the working men basically and uh who like turn the wrenches and so now how do you how do you motivate them these guys are from the philippines you have nothing in common with them basically besides the fact that you both like sailing so how do you you have to be able to have conversations with them you have to be able to and every single person is a different they like a different style of leadership a guy who's like a hothead is not gonna you're not gonna be able to talk to him the same way who another guy who just loves working for you you know mm-hmm. a guy who keeps fighting you for everything you're not gonna be able to say talk to him the same way as a guy who who just who loves you and just wants to work for you you know mm-hmm. so you have to there's different you have to talk to every single person a different way and it doesn't mean fake it just means you have to go to their level and see where to form a at. connection exactly exactly and that's what now you, you said that there wasn't any right way or any wrong way but in your travels and being under under guys is there certain leadership qualities that you think like maybe across the board really shouldn't be had and should be kind of erased from leadership leadership qualities i'm trying and like things that you saw in superiors i mean not necessarily superiors but you maybe you saw from just around you where you thought like this is not this is a poor example of leadership i mean the, the most simple thing especially at like service academy is like so this guy so they inspected our shoes if he is inspecting your shoes and he's saying that they're not shined and then he's wearing so you have leathers and you use shine to shine your shoes if he's wearing core frames they're plastic shoes <clears throat> that are always shined so now he's telling you that your shoes aren't shine enough and he's not even shining his shoes him his own shoes mm. what does that say about him mm. and now like- and then there's another guy who's or say if it's a, an officer, because we had like uh, CEOs of our company, like company officers, and he's been in the military for 40 plus years. So he's a 60 year old man. And he still shines his shoes every single day. And he, his shoes, you could see your reflection. in. if he tells you, oh, you didn't shine your shoes, you better go shine your shoes. You just, it's just, it's more of just like a, the more you show that you care as a leader and you're doing you've done everything that you're telling them to do. Mm, You just mm -hmm. gain respect as a follower. So it's nice to see when you're younger is like, what, what makes you gain respect for a leader? And you write Mm -hmm. that stuff down. Mm -hmm. I always write it down. And now I make sure I try to practice every single one of those things. Because if I'm like, if I'm every morning, we have to go around as seniors or whatever, every morning at King's Point, you got to open your door to nine degrees, zero, six hundred. So every morning and then you do cleaning station. So if you're sleeping in or somebody's sleeping in and they didn't open their door and you're knocking on their door, like a senior is knocking on their door because one morning they got up early to go work out because they feel, felt motivated that one day. They're knocking on your door, get your door open. But every other day of the week, they're closing their doors or on the weekends. They're still, they, they're sleeping until one in the afternoon. How do you respect him? Because he's just, he's, it's just, you see right through with the real and like the fake kind of, that's really what it's it is. Paper captain. Right. Or as Iggy Johnson says, jelly bean. 
exactly. It's just hard on the eyes, genuine. hard on the outside, soft on the inside. Exactly, exactly. And so uh, yeah, I mean, your first point with it was like, in any in any spectrum, any like levels lead through example. So like these guys who aren't like showing you that they've they're going through the trenches with you and shining their shoes, just for an example, like that's literally the exact opposite of that. Right. Exactly. And the same goes for the ship. I mean, just trying to relate it other than military on the ship. So these guys have been in the industry. They've been, they were probably active duty Navy and now they're just civilian side, but they know everything about their job. They are like these machinists or whatever. And so if you're giving them a job to work on, say, if you're in charge of a system, say a cargo crane, say, and you're telling them, yeah, go work on this or whatever. And you know, nothing about out the job that you're giving them they're gonna when they have a question and they come to you or they'll just push your buttons they know exactly what's going on but they want to like push your buttons they'll ask you oh what's going on and if you know nothing about the job that you just gave him that you just lost all respect so mm -hmm. something for example if you're going to give jobs to people underneath you you better know you better have read up on every single thing at least know the basics of what's going on with the crane give some ideas, read the manual, stay up all night reading a manual about a job before you give it to somebody. Because if you just give a job and you expect, oh, they'll know it, that's not, that's not what a leader does. A leader knows what's going on. Maybe you don't know everything because they know the specifics of the job. You at least know what's going on. You read the manual and they notice that like you actually care about what you're giving them. And that's kind of just like- Right, it's humility and just preparation of just you- you shouldn't just be giving jobs that you I'm trying to think of like the civilian. Yeah. Like you shouldn't just point. Them. Like, I mean, if you're, if you're just that, I mean, a CEO at a business, you shouldn't be telling people to do these things and you have no idea like right. how they're right. done or what the outcome should be. It's just exactly. blind. It's, it's like blind leadership. Really. You don't need to yeah. know how to perform the job to the level that they can do it, but you should have an understanding of it to know what you're asking of them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I like that. And that's another, that leads into another part of leadership is delegation. And that's one of the biggest things because there's obviously micromanaging. And that's another thing that I've kind of, I'm still kind of in my study with that because micromanaging and, you know, very laissez-faire kind of stay leadership or very off, like hands off or like, are you want to be hands on? So I think both are good at times. Obviously it's not neither. If you go too extreme with either one, it could be very bad, but Mm -hmm. say if a guy doesn't know his job or it's a new guy you want to be a little micromanager you give him jobs that you can trust and that builds your trust and then it hands off and then when he messes up that's fine he messed up and then now he knows why you're going to micromanage him again because he messed up and he should understand that mm -hmm. and so that's another part of leadership yeah delegation is you shouldn't be doing all the work yourself you have people to do that and that's probably mm -hmm. one of the hardest things going through the school as especially when you're a senior say when i like it's a company commander or whatever and so you have all these positions all your peers are positions like a watch officer a like a platoon commander all of them they have they could do they're fully capable of doing anything and everything just as you are so you just have to as a leader you have to know what their position is what their what they should be doing you have to know every single person's job basically and then you give them jobs based off of what their skills are and what position they hold and so just as a leader you you should take responsibility of so much higher than any other person there mm -hmm. and you should know what everybody's doing at every single point of the day or at least have an idea you don't know this need to know the specifics but you know what's going on and you just what know projects people picture. are working on right. what? you just know the bigger picture right yeah but at the same time having trust in them to not micromanage them exactly, exactly. Giving, giving do you think that's a do you think it's a tough balance that maybe in the military is hard to form because there is like a very big culture of extreme ownership and being like the one that is or just like in a leadership in a leadership position to like be able to put trust in people below you that they will get a job done? Or do you think that is just something that is taught that like the trust is, is necessary? Well, I think it's funny and it's funny in the military because especially the position I'm in now is that I'm, I just, I'm fresh out of school and I'm an officer. So there's enlisted guys underneath me. So now I now have to 
gain respect and trust from these enlisted guys because I am fresh. I I have I'm basically haven't been in the army my entire life, and these guys have been in there for five, 10, 15, 20, even more years, and they're both below me, which is is not really a thing, but you're just have to, you're the manager basically. And so you give them jobs and you just have to show them that you, you have to gain their respect basically. And so in the military, I don't really, I, it's almost easier to kind of gain trust from your subordinates because they most likely have been in a lot longer than you. And then as I, as I grow in the ranks and my military career, like I gain experience and whatnot, then once I'm in it for a lot longer then maybe a private comes in and is, he's an E1 enlisted guy, then I'll have to be like, okay, now I've been a little bit longer than you. I might know a little more, but mm-hmm. as far as the beginning of my career right now, you won't have a problem really with trust. Right. Because they know more than you. Mm. All right, so Nick, let's let's transition from here. Get after it. There you go. Jock on love, love that. Speaking of that, what about setbacks? Let's talk about setbacks in your career, in your life so far. There's been plenty of them. Obviously, the first one you spoke about already, not getting into King's Point, um, being a bit stubborn and saying, no, you're going there, and then getting basically a scholarship from them to go spend one year in New Mexico to then get into the school. Uh, to that, obviously, you showed them your commitment that, you know, you, you could sacrifice a year of your life to go to a school. That way you can get into it eventually. Um, but what about other setbacks? You know, you were a four-year lacrosse player. Uh, let's talk about some of those. Yeah, I mean, um, it's my favorite my favorite thing to talk about. But basically, how it, life, life <laughs> is just, it's so great. I love talking about this. Uh, I mean, life life is going to have all its setbacks and everything and it's everything everybody knows it's about perspective on on everything you go through and so how i've always looked at really is uh i mean things have happened but anything could destroy you or develop you and so freshman year had a great season whatever and uh broke my jaw so i couldn't play the rest of the season so i was like all right well broke my jaw in the game and uh luckily that didn't really affect me too much uh, because I didn't miss too many games and it was that end of the season but really the one that affected me more was junior year when I tore my ACL I lost that complete season so sophomore year we had a great year you I got all prepared for uh, junior year first scrimmage we had tore my ACL and so when setbacks like this happen I always had a mindset and Thinky Johnson kind of drove that into me where it's just like you're committed to you. You committed to being the best teammate that you could possibly be, and lacrosse is a part of it. But you're the best teammate. That's what you signed up for. You didn't sign up for it be the best lacrosse player you could be. By being the best teammate, you should be the best lacrosse player. But it's like a little, a little wording right there is why is what it encompasses really, so many more things than just yeah, playing and simply exactly. playing on the field. And because lacrosse won't always be there. So all four years and any time you should be playing a sport, you are playing the sport and you're being the best you could be in every way. But the sport in itself is, I feel, what sports is, it just develops your character. It gives you struggle through everything. And so that's why me tearing my ACL gave me, a, gave me some adversity to now I have that in my pocket now that's going to drive me even, even more to now I see a different part of the game, which I know, Sean, you've talked, both of you talked about when you get injuries, you see a different part of the game because you can't play now. So now you're on the sidelines watching it. And uh, so now you're, this is your time to get closer with your teammates. I mean, just see a different version of the game, look from the outside, see the whole defensive scheme that's going on. It's just, you can learn a lot more. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, I could have been sorry. I tore my ACL, I lost the whole entire season. I prepared all so long for this, but it's, it is what it is. What are you going to do? What is complaining going to do basically when you tore your ACL? Nothing. So you, you feel like all of these setbacks that you've, you know, garnered throughout your career and then in military, they're really just like resume points that right. are just, you're That's, building so that you have this extensive experience in all of these different areas. Right. Exactly. And, and I know like David Goggins always brings up, it's callousing the mind. And yeah. I, 
every single time that I ever got injured, I just loved it because both of you know, too, when you're playing in a game, and honestly, once you hit the college level, every single person's injured in some way, some fashion. But when you're playing the game and you have a slight energy and you're going up against the guy and say it's a hard battle or whatever, and you have in your mind that like your knee is so busted right now, but you will still destroy this man in front of you. It's just an edge. It just gives you yeah, it's, oh, it's a mental edge. <laughs> I love it. And so that's you why Vim- I, you Vimbergs, man. <laughs> I just, I, you know, you just got to injuries. I mean, they're going to happen. They're part of the game. I never let it. I never let it stop me from getting better in whatever way. There's always if there's mm-hmm. if you can't be a better athlete, if you can't run faster because you don't have a need to run on, then get better mentally or get get better. Be like a, a more of a coach type guy to the younger guys on the team whatever it is you know there's always a way to get better and that's how I took every adversity Mm -hmm. yeah I mean just how you worded that is really good like just being a better teammate there's so many different avenues now that you can look at right instead of just like oh I have a busted knee I can't run as fast like there's so many different ways to improve in that Mm -hmm. exactly do you feel like um like do you do you take the same lessons from failure like the same things in failure that are like you know things that are were in your hands you know like I feel like injuries sometimes can be these these things happen they're out of your hands but what about like failures that are for lack of a better phrase like your fault like do you take these same these same lessons and these same you know guidelines yeah I'm trying to think like I mean hundreds and hundreds of failures but the biggest thing is not getting the king's point so I didn't have the highest SAT score the thing is that whole entire time if you've done everything that you could possibly do I was studying the SAT books. I took each one seven times, ACT and SAT. If you've done every single thing you could do throughout that whole entire process of being committed and trying to achieve the results and you still didn't get it, if you've done every single thing you could possibly do, there's nothing There's nothing more you could ask for. You've just built yourself to an, a whole different breed of, a, and type of a person through that whole entire process of getting okay, better. Yeah. You know? So you're trying to achieve a result and you've worked beyond belief. You're not even the same person you are the next day as the last. That's that's all that it's about, really. That that's getting better as a person. So even if you failed, you still are no longer a person that you once were. And so you take that failure and you move on. You could still, I mean, that just means you need to get even more, even better, you know. So now you figure out what's wrong and you get better from there. And that's kind of how I've taken failures that are my how does, especially. Okay. And how does the, the, the military look at, look at failures? Because there's a lot of accountability involved. So like, what is, what are some of the drawbacks that you get in military life from, from failures and setbacks? Right. Uh, and that's, that's kind of something they just drove into us. I mean, everybody's going to fail. I'm trying to think of something like, um, I mean, what about, I, like, I just thought of it, like the classic you see in movies, like the beds made perfectly, but then they come and flip your mattress over and say, you didn't make your bed. Right. You know? That isn't that yeah. instilling you just failed and what are you going to do about it? Are you going to complain or are you just going to fix what's wrong? That's, it's that's more like something that's yeah. out of your hands. It's like right. knowing that, right? Right. That's basically, if basically, yeah, it's accountability and just, you can always get better. That's really what the military life and that whole scene and that kind of aspect of things is the fact that the whole entire, your whole entire freshman year is to show you that you can always get better. You will never be you will never be perfect. There will always, even if you are the best person, your bed is pristine. You could do anything to the room. There's, you could go in the room with a white glove, wipe anywhere, and you will never get any dust anywhere. They will find something wrong. There is always something wrong, you know? So they're instilling, like, there is no such thing as perfection, but we strive right. for it each time. Exactly. And that's, mm-hmm. that's really what they're instilling is the fact that you can never be the best you could be, but that shouldn't, that shouldn't bring you down. You should just be always trying to get better. And that's really like the biggest thing that they've instilled like freshman year. And mm-hmm. people think it's wrong. Oh, make them do so many pushups or not. It's no, it's because you're paying for the consequences. Pushups are the easiest thing, you know? And uh, it's really, yeah. Just Did yeah. you find that a lot of, I mean, how was it in your, especially in your freshman year where a lot of people coming and then leaving like you know was there a high turnover where people drop out because they didn't 
Like, it seemed like you had a good idea maybe going in and then you were able to see like why I'm, I'm doing these things. Right. But I would imagine for a lot of people, it's not so easy. Like, were there a lot of people who would, who would like complain and then leave? Like, does this happen a lot? Oh, definitely. I mean, there's just to give you an example, we started out, I think, with like 278 people in my class and of the original people, because you get setbacks, which are from a year prior, say medically. Uh, I think we had originally uh, like 178. So we lost like a third of our class. Wow. And uh, so a lot, a lot is in the beginning. I mean, people just sign up and they don't get like, like getting yelled at or they can't, they've never been yelled at in their life. And so they can't handle it. So they just leave because I don't know, they just don't like getting yelled at, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it just, there's a lot of people, some people went there. So it's Merchant Marine Academy. So I mean, you deal with boats, you're going to be on water. So you have to do swim classes. Some people have never swam in their life. Like some people just don't know what they signed up for, whether, whether their parents just sent them here, who knows what their intentions were. But I mean, there's yeah. definitely, there's always going to be those type of people though. I mean, yeah. it is what it is. Did you ever have a moment where you were close to, you know, hanging it up and feeling like this isn't for me? Or did you nope. never really get that close in that, in that line of thinking? <laughs> Never gotten it, never will. I don't know what <laughs> it is. This guy's like, yeehaw. Something's wrong. Maybe I'm missing something somewhere, but I don't know. There's a lot of people, a freshman year, they're like, yeah, there's going to be a point in Indoc that you're going to feel like you're going to quit. I don't know. I've never felt that. I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know what, I don't know. Maybe it's an ego thing. Maybe it's a. I mean, I think I it's know, just, I don't know. I you just agree. It. Yeah. You just agree with, you're you just, you feel at home. Right. You, you know what you signed up for. Exactly. And like, we've been we've been doing things like this as kids like hard stuff i can't like, i can't imagine i mean what the play we, we have like at the we, house have, we have like a million stories of things, of things we did like lifeguarding like funny story is like we we decided in like with like two days notice or something that we're gonna swim two and a half miles across the beach to the other side and like that's like i don't know how long it take us 50 minutes or an hour whatever it was like you know why not be it's gonna suck but like let's just make sure we're up to par but like the funny story about it is we had because there's boats going by so we had to have another lifeguard go on a surfboard and make sure he's next to us so a boat doesn't hit us they would never see us in the swimming so he goes out and we're swimming and we're going and like i said maybe i don't know how long it took probably let's say an hour it was about an hour so a long time where he's not talking to us he's just quiet just paddling next to us, making sure we don't get hit by a boat. Then we get to the other side. We're like dead. And we get, we get back to the lifeguard office and uh, everyone's like, Oh, how was it? Like we're exhausted, whatever. But then he's like, not really saying anything. And then he's, he comes out. He's like, yeah, it's like, I'm, I'm afraid of like deep water, like open deep water. I'm afraid of it. Like I'm afraid of sharks. And he's like, the Vimbers were just swimming away, you know, not talking to me. And now because of the surfboard, my nipples are chafing and now I'm bleeding in the water. Oh my God. And it was like this whole time I'm thinking like, I'm going to die of a shark attack. And these four kids are in the water and I'm here bleeding. The water is covered in blood. Oh, that was funny. Uh, yeah, wasn't there a biking story too? Or are you guys like oh, yeah, going yeah. to work? Yeah, we, we, uh, we decide let's bike to work. It's, uh, I don't know, whatever, 25 miles. Just have to leave extra early. We'll both have a big rucksack on back by with all our stuff and the bike. This is what, just like a random Tuesday. It was, it was like, a, yeah. like tomorrow, let's do this. And uh, sure enough, one of the bikes tires blown done. So <laughs> we got to scrap the bike. We throw it in the woods. And uh, for the proceeding, I think 12 miles, we alternated every mile. So one person would go on the bike with both backpacks and ride. The other one would run. And Mind you, his ankle was definitely messed oh, up. Oh, yeah. And this is like this is like six weeks off my ankle tearing. So I wasn't really ready to run, but hey, we got to get to work. So how are we going to do this? We're going to call a taxi? Of course not. <laughs> I mean, that's like that's like what many no, people would think. Like, oh, I got to get to work. Let me call a taxi. It's very funny. It's very funny to think of that because that option never even came across. The, the only option was we have to get to work. We're either we have, to, we have to hide the bike somewhere. That was like right. the first thought. And then we're like, exactly. all right, and then we'll just figure it out. I'm like, all right, well, we could sprint a mile pretty fast. And then you can just rest on the bike. And that's what we did. So if you had advice to give yourself, your 17-year-old self, before getting denied from King's Point, before going to New Mexico, what would you tell him? Man, 
Um, I mean, humility is the biggest thing of throughout the entire experience. But basically, there's one sentence I'd tell myself, probably be something along the lines with, I've gotten pretty lucky along the way. I mean, with every experience, every single thing that I've come across. But I think the biggest thing is to be so hungry, no matter how lucky you get, be so hungry to get to a next level, a new level, and keep getting better. And no matter what happens, keep going at it, keep going after it, you could always get better. And that's kind of what we've talked about the entire time is you could always get better. Keep moving forward. Damn right. Man. Keep moving forward is right. Keep moving I love forward. that. All right. Well, I think Nick's I think Nick's gotta sign us off again or you know, today. So yeah. What what's what's the order here? I mean, so let's see. Until next time, I think Nick's gotta say keep moving forward. Okay. So I'll go third. He'll go th- second and and last. Then. Yeah. So Nick, you say keep okay. moving forward and then make your own path at the end. Can you handle that? Roger that. <laughs> <What's-> <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> let's try. Let's try. Just let's try it. Until right. next time. Keep moving forward. Keep learning. And make your own path. All <laughs> right. Let's go. Footwork. Wow. Footwork is sponsored by ourselves, but also Kung Fitness and Merchant Designs, baby. Follow us on Instagram at footwork underscore podcast. Twitter is at footwork podcast. YouTube and Facebook, just check out Footwork Podcast, search it. Email us if you need anything, any questions at footworkpodcast at gmail.com. And remember, plug, plug, pass. Tell your parents, Amazon delivery guy, mailman, I don't know who, just tell them. Like, subscribe, review, all of it helps. Danke. in the face, kitty planted on my face, you know I need more than a taste, fuck a play, as I should treat a king, then we do the dash, do the race, uh, cause I'm a young black man dreaming for, and what I'm aiming for, you think it's in the rave, I'm just saying with the stars, no I'm chilling with the guards, draped in Pierre Mars, type shit, should be painted on the walls, young niggas working hard, got it all in the palms, young Nas, old Tony told me that the world is yours, Young niggas, young world, we living in it Get into it, not mind my business, we need that spinach Gotta get it, that's every minute, the clock be ticking These bitches stripping, and these niggas, they pawns be itching Young niggas, young world, we living in it Get into it, not mind my business, we need that spinach Gotta get it, that's every minute, the clock be ticking These bitches stripping, and these niggas, they pawns be itching Look at my niece, all I see is black excellence Building up my people with the messages Working towards the better man See my niggas shining up forever win Why I'm in the stool whipping that medicine to heal your soul Make sure our story told Working hard, charging double And that's just for what we owe Young King Jean Michel Need a crown made of gold Need my clothes extra cozy Keep a bubble for the gold Sitting back, making art And that's just off what I saw Young Nas, old Tony told me that the world is yours Banks, 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 banks.